was an elf. He already was an elf. He didn't have to. He didn't have to strive for that goal. It was yeah. already attained. Our guest is uh, House Majority Leader Derek, uh, Delegate Eric Householder, who joins us via telephone. Eric, good morning to you. Good morning, gentlemen. I was really trying to figure out where this conversation was going. <laughs> it was not <laughs> with that interest. It was going toward desserts, yeah. I guess, man. Do you have a favorite cookie, yeah. Eric? Is there one a particular cookie that uh, strikes your fancy? It's got to be a peanut butter cookie. That's that's the ones I, that I like. That's so. the nutter butter. It's my favorite cookie. Yeah. 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 Peanut butter cookies are good. But I don't. I'm like Matt Miller. I don't remember that jingle for the nutter butter. So. And I'm 56. I don't know when it came out, but I don't remember that jingle. That's about what Matt is, right? Yeah, 57. So, yeah. yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm 61. What are you, John? 65? 66? 67? 67. Yeah. Full <laughs> well, yeah. Social Security benefit. So- uh, well, yeah, I could, but I'm choosing not to. Oh, you're gonna? You know, I'm gonna go another three. Take it up to seventy. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, Eric. Let's uh, let's talk turkey here. It's uh, the Thanksgiving right. season, right? So, yeah, you you will officially leave office when? Uh, January eighth is my last day. So, and it was uh, weird not seeing my name on the ballot. You know, everybody has been asking me. You know, am I going to miss it? And I think I'm going to miss the people the most. Uh, I've enjoyed. I think it's been an honor to serve, you know, down here and to serve the citizens of Berkeley County. But yeah, it was a little weird not seeing my name on the ballot. But I was glad that uh, uh, my replacement, uh, Lisa White, did very well. I congratulated her and and others that won. It was a big night for Republicans across the nation, especially in West Virginia. Have you had Governor Elect Morrissey on since he's won? Has he been on? Uh, we've tried. Okay. I'll leave it at that. Okay. We've okay. we've made efforts. Well, I'll put a little bug in his ear. I'm going to see him today. He's got a press conference today at ten, so I'm anxious to see what he's going to talk about today at ten o'clock. But uh, yeah, I'll put a little bug in his ear and maybe come on the show. So yes, and speaking of which, if you've yeah. been having discussions, I know he's in the process of putting together an administration. Have you been in talks with him in regards to a post? I I have not had any discussions per se with that. Uh, uh, he has released a, 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 a the, the the transition portal, and for your listeners, it's called wvprosperitygroup.com. If you're interested in working for the administration, or if you're just interested in sharing policy ideas, you would go to wvprosperitygroup.com, and you can submit your application, your resume. If you're inter- like I said, if you're interested in working for the administration, or if you just have policy ideas that you want to make uh, West Virginia better, so that's that was launched uh, uh, last week. So everything's up and running, and I and I suspect that's what a lot of this press conference is going to be about today. He's asked me to be there, so I told him I could make it, so I'll be there. So have you had conversations with Lisa White, who is your successor? Oh, absolutely, yes, absolutely. And I told her before that I'm willing to help in any way if she needs any help from me. You know, make that transition smooth for her. I'm there. So, what advice? You- I was surprised. What I was surprised to hear about the little snafu with uh, Kevin Knowles in that district. You know, yes. because part of that district has the New York Avenue and part of Martinsburg, where they had the uh, the wrong delegate listed on that ballot. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Joe DeSoto's name appeared where Lisa White's name should have appeared. Right. Joe was not aware of the mix-up. Lisa was not aware of it until Mike Hornby told her about it at the Morrissey Gathering on election night. Yeah, I heard about it on your radio show. I mean, Kevin didn't reach out to me, so I didn't know anything about it. But uh, he he made the right calls, evidently. But, uh, yeah, just shows you how easily mistakes can happen. So what does Lisa White need to know as a newbie going down there for the first time after a mm-hmm. person such as yourself with tons of experience, leadership position as well, what does uh, what well? I think the know? biggest thing, and I've heard her several times on your show. She's very articulate, and I think she does have a very good understanding of the issues. The biggest thing for anybody when you come down here is just a, your your first your first session down here. Just learn the process, start learning about the rules because that's really what it's all about, and build relationships. And uh, that's what I said. I'm really going to miss a lot of the people. I don't know that I'm I'm going to miss the process and all the sausage grinding. You know, I had the distinct honor of saying um, that I was the majority leader over the largest Republican majority that we've ever had in our state's history. But not anymore. Now we're up. We went from 89 to 91. So the next majority leader will have that distinct ability. So let's talk money, Eric. October we missed yeah. the revenue numbers by 15 million dollars. Are you leaving office with any concerns about the revenues? 
No, and if you if you do a little deeper dive, and, and, and you're right, yes, we were a little soft. We were about 15 million from our estimates, but overall for the year we were like 13.8. But October 31st ended on a Thursday, November 1st, Friday. That next day, collections were like 21 million dollars. So it, a lot of this is is timing, and and that's you know important. And uh, we could have easily been five million to you know to the positive. But uh, no, I, I'm not concerned. Uh, you know, we're three months in. Remember, usually it's about six months in before a governor would have to make some decision. If the governor, uh, a governor-elect Patrick Morrissey, would would do some type of a budget cut, maybe a one percent or two percent. But uh, no, keep in mind also we have 400 million stashed back in this personal income reserve fund. If we needed any cash. Uh, we also have over $1.2 billion in a rainy day fund. So we're, we're sitting on a lot of cash here on the sidelines. And I think overall, as you start to come into you know, your Black Friday and, and Christmas, you're going to see the consumer sales tax increase a little bit. I read an article this morning on Metro News where um, I didn't get a chance to attend the, uh, the uh, Finance Committee meeting yesterday, but even though our sales tax was a little softer, Mark Muko, who uh, works for uh, Revenue, he stated that uh, vehicle sales were up. So, pe- so consumers were purchasing more in uh, the bigger ticket items like uh, vehicles, and, and that sales tax is called a privilege tax. So it's it's on the road uh, the road fund side. So I mean, it was up like ten million dollars. So consumers were just making different choices at the at the time. They weren't buying, you know, more in groceries and and other. Um, you know, issues that, that that would reflect more on the sales tax side. They were buying bigger ticket purchases like vehicles and so forth. Matt Miller. It is that time to buy the car for your loved one for Christmas. Those commercials always yeah. boggled my mind, you know, when you would see the, the, the man take his wife outside in the morning on the commercial and, and there's this car with a ribbon on top. And I'm like, that's a pretty big purchase that I you, you make right. on your own. Yeah, I bought this for you, hon. We'll be paying yeah. for it for the next seven years. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Just the logistics of sneaking it into the driveway. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I always did think you got a better deal in, in December because, the, you know, the vehicle sat there all summer long, all, all year long, and I think a lot of these auto dealers want to unload them. But I always felt like you could get a better deal in December. Maybe I'm wrong. Hey, Eric, you did mention uh, the, the $400 million in that income tax reserve fund and that, that we do have as a state kind of a lot of money on the sideline. What would it take to get into that money? Um, are, are there certain stipulations that have to go on when it comes to the income tax to be able to use that money? No, at any time, either the legislature, remember the whole role of the legislature is to appropriate money. If the legislature feels that uh, we need to inject cash or if the administration, if they also feel the need, either side has easy access to it. Uh, So, yeah, it's not a problem. But that money also was designed to be there in case um, the reductions to the income tax present an issue. So do you have to then put something back into that to maintain some level of, of money on the side? Well, to answer your question, the answer is no. You don't ever have to put any more money into it. Um, and could the money be used only specifically for the personal income tax? And the answer is no. I mean, at any time, if the legislature felt the need that they wanted to uh, uh, boost up whatever, you know, they could, I mean, they have access to money. That's the whole role of the legislature is to appropriate money. So if they felt a need, uh, you've heard PEIA, other things, they could dip into it. So that's, that's you know. That's a concern, but that's what it was set up for is in case things were to go awry, you would be able to backfill the personal income tax uh, side of your of your ledger. And, and, you know, but no, the legislature, they could spend it on anything that they so desire. You talked about missing the relationships, but not necessarily the sausage making that happens in a legislature. With your knowledge and expertise and uh, what really seems to be a, an enjoyment uh, each time I hear you or get a chance to talk with you on this program, the enjoyment of the numbers and the finances and keeping track of all of that, would you love to stay involved in some way in that capacity? Uh, absolutely, uh, but uh, we're going to have to wait and see what the future dictates for me, um, you know. Uh, unfortunately, Patrick has not made any commitment to anybody, and um, you know, 
I think you're going to start seeing those commitments come forward here within the next two months because obviously Governor-elect Morrissey will take over uh, here soon, and February is the start of the legislative session. But, uh, no, I, the only thing that I have mentioned to Patrick is, look, I'm willing to help out. I'm willing to serve, and wherever you feel that I could best you know, help you. And uh, But, no, I've never, I haven't asked him for any specific uh, jobs or anything like that. If he feels that there's a need for me, then, you know, obviously we have to have a conversation and, and we'll go from there. But uh, any way that I can help, if it's something that I want to do, then maybe I might consider it. If not an official role, are there consulting type roles that, that you as a legislature, you know, have those folks that, that kind of help to chime in, double check, if you will, make sure uh, that, that budgets and things like that are, are the way that you intend them to be? I don't know that there's a per se consultant role, but uh, I don't know that I would be uh, inclined to want to pursue that. I mean, I'm currently working. I've got a great job. I'm working. The only part of my job that I hate is driving down to Northern Virginia every day. I thought you were going to say uh, to Frederick every couple months. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, the traffic on 81 and traffic on 66, it's enough to pull your eyeballs out, mm-hmm. you know. But, uh, no, I mean – I think it's that as my approach to Patrick was, look, if there is anything that I can help you out, if you see a need for me, and I'm willing to help you out. So, And I just left it at that. I know there's a lot of people that are bartering, trying to get his ear, trying to trying to ask for specific jobs, and uh, I just think that's the wrong approach. You know, Obviously, I think he's made his mind up. He probably already knows where he wants to put specific key, key personnel. He wants the best for West Virginia. You know, he, he wants the brightest and the best to come, and he really wants to turn West Virginia around, and uh, I think he'll do it, you know. But uh, I think somewhere along this line, he does have an idea of where he wants to put people. John but Gilstrap. That's why, I mentioned, that's, why, well, that's why I mentioned, once again, wvprosperitygroup.com. If you want to work for the administration, submit your resume, and you could be considered. Eric, this is John. Good morning. Um, Good morning, John. I want to get into the sausage making a little bit. You're leaving quite a vacuum. You guys are making me hungry. (laughs) You're leaving quite a vacuum in the leadership. Uh, Departing majority leader, what's happening behind the scenes, not specifically by name, but what's happening behind the scenes to fill that vacuum in terms of um, leadership? Uh, I was advocating for another gentleman to replace me as majority leader, uh, John Paul Hutt from Grant County. Uh, I think John Paul Hutt would be a great replacement. He's very common sense, very level-headed, good demeanor, people like him, respect him. But the majority whip, Marty Gearhart, who came in when I came in in 2010, mentioned to me that he would have, like to be the majority leader. So I've kind of switched gears, and and uh, but really the, the speaker has the final say. What will happen here in December Uh, Lisa White and all the new delegate elects, they'll come down for that December interim, and they'll get a chance to elect a new speaker. And then it's up to the speaker to decide where his key legislative roles are. I'll have a, you know, I'll have a little input. Hey, Mr. Speaker, I think Marty Gearhart from Mercer County would be a great replacement for for me or John Paul Hunt. But uh, he could, you know, take my advice or he could pick somebody else. But, uh, yeah, it's ultimately his decision. So. so majority leader is selected by the speaker. It is not elected by the caucus? That's correct. Yeah, oh. that's correct. So the, the only election there is is for the speaker. Now, keep in mind, if you're, if you're running for speaker, you're going to want to keep certain one of those key positions close to your chest because, obviously, if there's somebody that the members don't like, if they think that a speaker is going to go this one direction, then you could see a challenge for the speaker's race. Right now, I'm not hearing any of that. So I think it's going to be seamlessly, you know, either you're going to elect Roger Hanshaw as your next speaker. And he's done a great job. He's done a great job in the House. And uh, and I've enjoyed serving with him. And uh, it's that's one of the things that I'm going to miss. Now, I will tell you, I didn't, I didn't really care for the role as majority leader as I did for the, as the finance chair because that was more my forte. I did enjoy being the finance chair more so than, than the majority leader. And I don't know if you know the story of how I got to become the majority leader. Have I ever told you all the story? I don't think I so. I don't think so. Okay. Well, that scenario, uh, three and a half years ago, there were rumblings, okay, that um, – 
the the speaker was now going to, our our former majority leader Amy Summers she was she decided that she did not want to become the majority leader the following year she didn't want to serve in that capacity so the rumblings were the speaker was going to pick somebody else and the next thing you know we had a challenge we had Brandon Steele from Raleigh County he decided he was going to challenge the speaker and uh the whole part of this whole process, if you want to keep your seat of where you're at, you need to back the right horse because if you don't back the, the winner, you're going to be committed to the back row. So uh, as the rumbling started increasing, I started hearing people complaining. They were calling me, and they were saying, hey, householder, the speaker is going to pick this guy for majority leader, and if, and if he does, we're going to vote for Brandon Steele. So I kind of took one for the team. I called the speaker, and I said, look, a lot of members are upset that – they're hearing rumors that you're going to pick this guy, and uh, I didn't want the Eastern Panhandle to lose out because we had we had key and we had everybody basically in the Eastern Panhandle and and either as a chair or a vice chair in some some committee, and uh, so I decided I said hey look if you need me to I'll come down and serve as your majority leader, and uh, he said okay. And I said, but I have one caveat. I want Marty Gearhart as my uh, majority whip because I, I think, you know, we need strong people to help you on the conservative side. And then I started counting votes, and uh, that's basically how it went down. So the night of the uh, the actual vote count, uh, we uh, beat Brandon Steele, I think, by 30-some votes, 32, I believe, exactly. So, But, no, that's the reason why I gave up my chair of finance to come down to be majority leader because – if not, Brandon Steele could have been elected as the um, the new speaker. I would have lost as finance chair. I would have been committed to the back row. Everybody else in the Eastern Panhandle would have lost. Paul Espinoza, Chuck Horst, every other delegate that we had, uh, Wayne Clark, all of them would have lost. So uh, that, I took one for the team and went down and became the majority leader. I thought that vote was that a little a little closer than that, Eric. I thought that was like 55 you know, to 33. Um. I think it was thirty some votes that we that we uh beat him by. But uh anyways that's that's the story of how I became the majority leader. But like I said, it's it's been an honor to serve under Roger, but uh majority leader is somebody who takes all the arrows for the speaker. The majority leader makes the speaker looks good look good. The the majority leader has to tell the members no. Yeah, you know, the majority leader is doing all the motions on the floor. You know, that's the role of the majority leader. But so uh now that you're on 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 your way out, you've yeah. you've served your time. Let me ask you a philosophical question here. Are I is, in prison? I, gonna, I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the the super super duper majority that yeah, we have majority. is is mm -hmm. that ultimately the healthiest way to have a legislature? Should, it's very. I'll say this. It's very difficult. So one of the things that I did as majority leader, I said, okay, we're going to have a caucus every morning at 8 a.m., and we're going to run through the calendar. So just so your listeners realize, when I first got elected, I was in the minority. We didn't have staff. We were committed. We had to read the bills. We had to understand everything. I think now as these majorities get larger, people also get per se a little lazier because we had to have caucus every morning at 8 to run through the calendar and one of the things that I said, look, we're not going to read, we're not going to stand up here and tell you word for word that's in the bill. What this caucus is about every morning is for you to come to this caucus. You've already read the bill, and if there's any questions, we'll answer it. And then we're going to make a decision: do we want to run this or not? And if there were issues, if someone said, "Hey, there's issues here," I would postpone action one day. If there was enough people that were against something, then I would say, "Okay, look." Let's let's put it on the back burner. Let's see if there's any more work that we can do on this bill to get it any better. And then and then if the rumor or rumblings were louder, then we just went ahead and said, no, we're not going to run it. But, uh, no, that was the biggest thing is, is just having a caucus every day to go through and run through the calendar. That's what we call it. You're basically listing all the bills that are on third reading, second reading, and first reading. And we're going down through every one of those bills, and we're talking about them. And remember, whenever a bill comes to the House floor, it's almost assumed it's, one, it's a Republican bill, and two, you're voting green on it because you've already had discussions behind closed door. Now, we've never said, hey, you've got to vote green on every bill. We, we never do that. Yeah, each person represents their own district. 
you've got to represent and you know how you feel that your district would would want you to vote and uh but yeah that's basically that's behind the scenes every day we would have a caucus at eight o'clock we would run it from eight to nine and we would run down to the, through the calendar and we gave every member an opportunity to speak up if they had any problems and the other reason we were doing that was to mitigate our floor time because look the last thing that i wanted is if we spent an hour in caucus talking about a bill and finally getting it resolved we shouldn't spend an hour out on the house floor rehashing everything that we just talked about in caucus so it was more uh, we were trying to speed up the process we've already discussed it you're, it's go time you're either voting green or you're voting red if you're going to vote red all we ask is that you tell us you know don't tell us that you're going to vote green then go out there and change your mind uh you know at least be forthcoming and say hey this is where i'm at on this bill you know sometimes what i've witnessed out there on the house floor is uh, people will change their votes based upon a uh, an emotional argument and I've, and I've seen it happen a lot of times somebody will stand up and make an emotional argument might not be any logic to it but uh, yeah it'll persuade someone to change their vote eric we are uh, just about out of time i thank you very much for yours yes sir and enjoy your last two months as a member of the house of delegates sir well and I'll, I'll make the same invitation to you guys at any future time after January 8th. If you need my help for anything, I'll be glad to come on and help. I can see that being so, a, a thing. I can see that happening. All right, guys. Right? Yep. All right. E, have yourself so, a great day, man. We'll see you guys. Bye.